have any introductions you need to make or, or say anything? Um, well, uh, thank you for the attendees that are here and thank you uh, to Amy um, to being the brave soul to do this uh, via a go-to meeting. Um, we're excited to have you folks here in this new landscape um, and hopefully um, we can continue to do these and reach out to our community. So thank you again, Amy, for presenting this. This is exciting. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is my first time using GoMeeting as well. So um, this this will be fun and interesting. Um, we got a pretty small class, so we should have plenty of time for questions. That's great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera just to not be distracting. So there I go. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. you still hear me okay. So, yep. all right. So today we're going to talk about growing small fruits in Colorado. Um, before I moved out to Colorado about five, uh, four years ago, um, I was actually a research analyst for the University of Kentucky's fruit and vegetable program. And I also ran a small farm uh, for Moorhead State University, also in Kentucky. Um, so I had my, got, was able to get my feet wet in a lot of different areas of small fruits. So I've um, worked on projects growing strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, um, some bush cherries, and then some other tree fruit and stuff. So it's it's been, a, it was a lot of fun to do that kind of work. Um, Coming out to Colorado, though, things are very different here, and so I kind of had to relearn a little bit of what I um, what I learned back there. So today, during our class, we are going to cover the following uh, small fruits. So we're going to start out, we're going to go really in-depth with strawberries and raspberries, because I feel like these are the two fruits that most people are growing, um, and they're also somewhat easy to grow here. So um, we'll start out with those. We'll touch on blackberries. We'll touch on blueberries. I'm probably not going to tell you what you want to hear when it comes to blueberries. Um, they're difficult to grow here. And then we'll cover a group uh, of the ribes, which is currants, gooseberries, and josta berries. Those are all really closely related. And then if we have time, I will try to get to grapes. So let's start out with the strawberries. Um, they have an interesting history, strawberries. So the first plants were actually brought from the Americas over to France. So there was a plant brought from North America and a plant brought from Chile over to France. And then they crossed them there way a long time ago. And that's how we started to make the strawberries that you and I are used to eating today. So it, it kind of has a, an interesting history to it. The berries of the strawberry are actually an enlarged flower receptacle. And the fruits are the little seed-like things that you see on the outside. Um, and so together, this whole structure is called an akeen. As far as the strawberry plant goes, I wanted to show you this picture so that you can get an idea of the different parts of the plant. Um, we've got our main top system, our leaves. And then we've got our root system and where those two come together, that's called the crown of the plant. And I just wanna point that out here because for strawberries, that's pretty important, that crown. Um, in a slide later on, I'm gonna show you how to plant strawberries and it's very important to notice where that, that particular um, spot on the plant is. Off of that crown, um, again, you'll get that leafy growth, but you'll also get these um, kind of stem-like things or roots that are called stolons, and they actually put out daughter plants along this runner as it goes. And so um, for, you know, if you want to make more strawberries, you can actually cut those daughter plants off and cut a, on either side of that, um, that runner, leave the roots on and replant those. So there's three main types of strawberries. There's June bearing, ever bearing, and day neutral. And I'm going to cover all three of these because they're they're really managed a little bit differently. No matter what, all of these are perennial plants, so you will get them back year after year, as long as we don't have some kind of crazy, like we did this year, hard freeze in the middle of you know either October or September, November, you know somewhere in there that can sometimes take the plants out. And then sometimes you can get um, these late spring frosts that will nip the flowers. So, um, but they are all perennial and they should all come back each year. 
when they flower it depends on which type you have so the chart up here actually shows the flowering period and then the fruiting happens toward the end of those arrows so for the june bearing types you really only get one main harvest they're going to start flowering in late march and they'll continue to flower and develop those fruits and here even though they're called june bearing they really bear more in july so here pretty soon we should start to see some strawberries coming on um, then we have the ever bearing types and these are a little different. They're going to put out a spring harvest. So you'll get that late March flowering starting to happen, those fruits showing up in July. Then they're going to take a break because it just gets too hot for them. And then they'll put on a second flush of flowers and fruit toward the end of the season. So usually by the end of October, um, right before that first frost comes in the fall, you'll be harvesting some strawberries. And then we have the day neutrals. And these are very similar to the everbearing, but they do tend to fruit throughout the season. So you'll get kind of a, um, a, a decent spring crop, maybe some strawberries here and there through June, July, and August. And then you'll get another crop later in the season with a pretty good amount. That flowering and fruiting, all of that has to do with daytime temperatures and the or darkness and so for that reason that's why we see those harvests happening in the spring or in the fall for the most part so for the june bearing let's start with those um, these again produce that one crop each year usually in july along the front range the flowers are actually set the previous fall you don't see the flowers until march or april but they set those little flowers way back in the fall again and this is why you could lose your crop. Um, so similar to lilacs. They do tend to have the larger fruits, the higher yields. Um, they tend to be a little more flavorful. Uh, so some people want to take this chance. But again, because of that, those big swings in temperatures and those late spring frosts, if your flowers do get hit um, by that late spring frost, you've lost your shot. Because again, this is only one harvest per season. Um, these are really popular for making jams, uh, for freezing, for fresh eating. These are the kinds that you would probably be dipping into chocolate to make chocolate covered strawberries with. So here's some cultivars that are great for Colorado. Um, you can try any of these out. And again, just email um, Chris and she'll get you the copy of the slide. So you'll have this list for you. Um, I don't know all the different attributes of all these different varieties, but I do know that these do tend to do pretty well in Colorado. There are a few that have been tested and don't do as well, and those are at the bottom. So avoid planting Dunlap, Fairfax, Robinson, and Red Star. They're just not going to be um, quite hardy enough for here. So that was the June bearing. Again, now we've got the ever bearing. We've got those two fruiting cycles happening in early summer and in, in, um, sorry, in July and then again in the fall. These are going to be a lot more reliable here in Colorado just because of that cold weather. If you lose your flowers in the spring, that just means you're going to have a heavier crop come fall. So you're, you're not out for the year. Um, again, they might fruit lightly between those heavy crops and these are going to be smaller berries. So just know that it's kind of you take what you can, you know. So here are some uh, different varieties that do well in Colorado. Uh, Fort Laramie is a really popular one. I hear this one mentioned a lot. I personally just bought some Quinaults this year and planted those up. Uh, I was a little late on my planting. It was maybe about three weeks ago, um, but they're, they're doing okay. They're growing. And then Ogallala is another good one. Two that don't necessarily do well here are Ozark Beauty and Rock Hill. So then we have this interesting day neutral strawberry. And this is actually a ever bearing strawberry that was bred into these day neutral types. So all day neutral strawberries are actually ever bearing, but not all ever bearing strawberries are day neutral. So that's a little confusing. <laughs> but again, just know that they're gonna flower and set their fruits um, for most of the summer and the fall. And, and they might get into these cycles where every six weeks you're getting another little crop of fruit. Um, these don't like to be super hot, so um, you'll see that the blossoms are gonna slow down sometimes and maybe even stop during hot weather. Um, just wait it out. You can provide a little light uh, shade covering and that might help get them through that hot spell. Uh, 
Um, they do need um, constant light fertilization because they are flowering and fruiting through the whole season. And I'm going to talk in a few slides about um, how to fertilize all these strawberries. The plants for day neutral are sensitive again to the drought and to the heat. So irrigation is really important with those day neutral types. You want to make sure that they're not drying out. And again, just like the other ever bearing types, the fruit on these is going to be pretty small, but still tasty. So here are a few cultivars that do well in Colorado, Tribute, TriStar, and Fern. Um, these day neutral types were actually developed from plants in the West. So they were kind of made for, um, you know, being reliable here. So some tips when you're buying your strawberries, you want to purchase those plants bare root in early spring. So you may have missed the mark this year, but if you can still find some out there on the market, um, I don't think it's too late to plant if they are the ever bearing and the day neutral types, you might still be able to get a little bit of crop at the end of the season. Um, you could probably plant the June types, just know that you won't get any fruit till next year. When you're searching for your zone, and I say this for all of the fruit crops, whether it's um, apples or berries or whatever, um, you might want to just consider yourself a zone down from what it tells you you're at. So here in the in the Greeley area, we're usually typically uh, zone 5B. I like to just say, let's go with zone 4, and that just means it's going to handle a little bit colder weather. Again, we just have to really work with our Colorado climate. So, so if you're choosing something that works well up in Montana or Canada, it's going to do well here. <laughs> so, all right. So talking about all of these types of strawberries, let's talk about how to grow them. When you're choosing a site for your strawberries, you want to make sure you have at least eight hours of sunlight and protection from wind as well. Um, they definitely need their sun. As far as the soil type goes, and this is pretty true with most of your fruiting crops, they really need a well-drained soil that's um, pretty high in organic matter. There are some exceptions to this when we get to grapes. I'll talk about that and currants. They can do better in a leaner soil, um, but your strawberries are going to want that high organic matter content. If you have clay, you might consider growing these in raised beds, and that's going to help with better drainage. They like to be consistently watered, but they also don't like to dry out. So, um, so disease pressure. There are some diseases and in, in insects that we see in strawberries. And so to help with some of those that are in the soil itself, and we, we recommend that you really not plant strawberries in the same spot following other strawberries, raspberries, or what we call the solanaceous crops. Those are things like tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, and eggplant. And then also your vining crops. So if you've got pumpkins or cucumbers, squash, zucchini, things like that, because these are all in the same family. And so there are certain soil diseases that if you have trouble with your tomatoes one year, you pull those tomatoes out and you plant strawberries the next year, you could very well see those same problems. They're all in the rose family. As far as establishment goes, you know, they can be very fussy. And I'm going to show you again this chart in my next slide um, just to show you how fussy they can be. Um, they want to be planted at just the right depth. But once you get them going, they can be pretty aggressive and they can spread. So you can see in that bottom picture there that, you know, they can definitely get out of hand pretty quickly. So here is that chart I've been mentioning um, to show where the crown of the plant is and how you really have to make sure that that crown is just above the soil line. Um, if you plant it too deep, you will get what's called um, crown rot, where that crown will just start to rot out because it's under the ground and it's getting too much moisture. If you plant it too high, those roots can start to dry out around the crown and the plant can die off. Um, and then, you know, just to for better plant establishment, we like to say to go ahead and fan those roots out as much as you can and try not to just push them off all to one side. Um, so that's how you want to plant your plants. Once you get those things established, um, mulch is a really great thing for strawberries. They are very shallowly rooted plants. And so that mulch is going to really help um, do a few things. It's going to conserve your soil moisture. It's going to keep your soil temperatures nice and cool. Um, just underneath that mulch. 
It's gonna help you out and save you time by reducing weeds surrounding your plants. And again, I said these are shallow rooted. So if you're going in there and trying to pull weeds, you can easily pull up these plants at the same time. And so you wanna um, use that mulch to help reduce the weeds that you do have. And I'll say this about the weeds, get them really early in your strawberry patch so that you're not disturbing that root system. So um, weed, frequent, weed frequently in that strawberry patch. And then um, in the summer, if you want to, you can use grass clippings, you can use weed-free straw, um, you can use other organic materials. You know, um, I've even seen people use just regular mulch. I think the straw probably is the best thing for them. Uh, um, unless you're growing on a hill system which has a plastic covering and I'll show you some pictures of that here in a, in a minute. Um, if you are going to use your grass clippings from your lawn, just make sure that you've not been applying herbicide to your lawn because then you could take those grass clippings and transfer them to your, your garden beds and that herbicides can start to kill your uh, plants. So um, just make sure you're not using grass clippings with herbicide. So there's two main systems when you're growing these plants. Um, there's what we call the matted row system, which is kind of a flat sprawling system. And then there's this hill system where we're growing these things on mounds. And really the June bearers prefer that matted row. They're gonna have lots and lots of runners, the June bearers. And so you wanna allow those runners to fill in that area. Um, those runners are eventually gonna become the plants in future years and then eventually you'll take the mother plants down. And you can do a lot of this with just mowing through these rows. And so again, June bears, lots of runners, they prefer that system on what you're seeing on the left there. And there's more detail on CSU's website and I'll give you some, uh, I'll give you the link at the end um, that explains these two systems better. Um, for today, I just wanna to touch on them. So the second system off to the right there is what we call the hill system. And you can see that those strawberries are up mounded, you know, on a, on a hill. And here they've used black plastic as their mulch. And I know you can't see me, but I'm putting quotes around that. Um, that is what we call a type of mulch because it's still keeping weeds down. It's still conserving moisture. It is not going to keep it cooler though. It's going to actually heat up the soil temperature a little bit um, around those plants, but I think for these it's okay. The everbearing and the day neutral types, those ones that you're getting that spring and that fall crop, they actually prefer this hill system. They like to be up off the ground. And you know, they really, um, they don't have a lot of runners and what runners they do have, you're gonna be removing. And so that plastic helps to keep those runners from rooting into the ground. They can't get through that plastic. So those are the two main systems. You don't have to grow them like this. You can use strawberry pots. Um, you can just kind of plant some and see how they go. Um, the day neutral and the everbearing are what you wanna use though, if you're gonna be planting in containers. Cause again, you don't have all those runners. You're collecting those strawberries off the main plant. So for the June bears, the ones that we talked about in that matted row system, it's kind of flat and you let them kind of run. They're going to need about an inch of water per week when they're flowering and fruiting. So make sure that, again, you don't let these things dry out when they're flowering and fruiting. If you um, want to, though, you can start to save on water as soon as they're done with that, with that flowering and fruit set. Then you can really start to bring the water back. You want to wait until after they fruit, and then you want to fertilize. Um, the fruits on these are pretty thin skinned. They can get burned. Um, you don't want to push them into leafy green growth when they're trying to set fruits. Um, so fertilize once they're done. And when you do, you want to use what's called ammonium sulfate. And that's a 21% nitrogen product. But that ammonium sulfate, that sulfur in there is actually preferred by a lot of fruits. So you'll see that 2100, that's just nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. You'll see that throughout my presentation today, that you'll use ammonium sulfate for a lot of these different fruits as its fertilizer. If you start to see the leaves yellowing out, just know that that's a symptom probably of overwatering, and you're likely leaching the iron out of the soil and they just need a little bit of iron to help them back. And you can get micronutrient fertilizers as well if you need to add iron back in. 
for your ever bearing and your day neutrals. Um, with these, it's a little different. You're gonna remove that first flush of flowers on your first year plants. We wanna get all the energy going into building a good root system, growing a lot of top growth. And so um, as you go, this like this first year I planted 10 of these, I'm going to be removing my flowers and I'm probably gonna go ahead and remove my flowers until the middle of July, just because I got a late start on the planting. But what that's gonna do, again, it's gonna push all that energy into the roots, into the tops, it's gonna give you bigger plants. And then when they do start setting flowers and fruits down the road, maybe in, in say August or September, um, they're gonna have more energy to work with. So you'll get a better fall harvest. I'm not gonna expect to get any strawberries here soon. With, again, with these ever bearing and day neutral types, you wanna remove all those runners. Um, you wanna push all the energy into that main plant, that mother plant. With these, you fertilize a little bit differently. You wanna fertilize throughout the growing season, not just once after it flowers. And to do that, you're just gonna use a smaller amount of that same ammonium sulfate 2100 fertilizer. Um, this is per 100 square feet, a quarter cup. And I'm, I don't think many of you are growing 100 square feet of strawberries. So um, it's very, very little that you're gonna be using. And with these ever bearing and these day neutrals, you're gonna to wanna to start a new patch every three to four years. And to do that, um, instead of letting the daughter plants go with these, you actually just wanna replant. Um, it's just gonna help you get better plants to you know, get your patch going quicker. I love this picture. Um, let's talk a little bit about harvesting strawberries. This is on a commercial level. And I just, I think this looks like it'd be fun to just ride around the field in this laying down, contraption, just picking strawberries as you go. <laughs> it just looks like fun to me. Um, when you're harvesting strawberries though, in your home garden, you wanna make sure that you're picking often. So every other day, if you can, during the peak of the season, um, these things ripen, they'll go from unripe to ripe pretty quickly. So you might leave one for a day or two, but then in a day or two, it's totally ready. Um, and then you'll also see some that go a little overripe. If you're gonna eat them right away, go ahead and just take, uh, just harvest those really red ripe ones. And you can leave the caps on the plants if you want to, if you're harvesting that frequently. But if you're not gonna use that fruit for a few days or you wanna prolong the shelf life, that's when you wanna really keep the cap on. That's just gonna help um, keep that fruit sealed up and keep it fresh longer. You can actually harvest these while they're still a little bit pink and they'll, um, they'll be, better in a couple days of storage. Um, don't let fruit sit on the vine. Go ahead and pick that. Um, squirrels love these, you know, rabbits can eat strawberries, your dogs, all kinds of critters out there that are gonna go after that unripe, or I'm sorry, that rotted fruit. And so just make sure you're getting off there so that you don't attract um, some of those things into your garden. As far as winter care with your strawberries, you want to make sure, again, keep that soil nice and damp um, all the way up until that, fro that fall frost. Um, and then you can start to hold, hold off on that water and that, that'll help harden those plants off. It'll kind of get them ready for that long winter. Um, one final watering in November right before that soil freezes up is going to be great to help prevent that winter kill. Um, that we often see uh, along the Colorado Front Range. Um, that goes for all your plants, trees, shrubs, um, some of your perennials, your fruits, your fruit plants like these. Give them a nice drink of water in November. Um, and then, you know, actually you should be checking them once a month throughout the winter. And if we get one of those nice warm spells where we've had three or four days in the middle of winter where you're not wearing a coat, <laughs> you really need to get outside and water your landscape. Um, in Colorado, a winter mulch of clean seed-free straw or something similar is highly recommended. And so you can see this picture is actually from Northern Indiana in at Purdue, kind of around the Chicago area. Um, and you can see how thick they're placing that straw on top of that hill. You really need to tuck these things in pretty well. Um, here in Colorado, it gets really windy, and so you might even want to take that um, straw and then cover it over with a little bit of bird netting or chicken wire or something to keep it in place because we all know it will blow away over the course of the winter. 
And then in, as spring starts to come again, so here we are in early March, um, get out there and look for some new growth on those plants. And you can just leave the mulch where it is, that straw down, but just pull the, the mulch away from the plants and let them kind of get used to the spring temperatures, especially those ups and downs. So I like to wait um, to really start pulling this back until a little later in the season. So we do see some major pests and diseases on strawberries, but honestly, in Colorado, a lot of these aren't much of an issue. You might have something here or there. Um, we are starting to see a little bit of what's called the spotted wing drosophila. This is a little fruit fly that will lay its eggs in small fruits like strawberries and raspberries and blackberries. Um, pick often, maybe pick a little early, but, um, it's just something that be on the lookout for that because when you do get spotted wing drosophila, it's something you'll probably want to treat for. Um, it's not widespread or anything, but we have seen it pop up here and there. Um, the other big one that we get around here are the last three, the birds, the rabbits, the deer. Um, and these are, you know, thankfully we can control these with exclusion. And so using things like bird netting, using things like um, good fencing around your garden, can help keep those away. So any questions on strawberries from anyone? I don't hear anything. I don't see anything in the chat. So let's go ahead and we'll just keep on rolling. Um, so let's talk about raspberries. So I want you to try to take two seconds and just clear your brain because I'm going to throw a little bit more terminology at you and I don't want you to get confused with the strawberry stuff you just learned. So take a deep breath. <laughs> Let's talk about raspberries. So we've got three different main types of raspberries. We've got red raspberries, black raspberries, and then we have purple raspberries. Um, the ones that you're probably used to eating and the ones that you see most often in the stores are the red raspberries. There we go. So here's a picture of a raspberry plant. And what I want you to notice is there's actually two different types of raspberry canes that you see growing. We have what are called the primocanes, which are one-year-old stems. And then we've got the floor canes, which have gone through a winter and now they're two-year-old canes. And the floor canes are the ones, and the, the name kind of alludes to it, that flora cane means florals. That's where you're gonna get your flowers and your fruit. Um, the primocanes are, again, growing up that first year, um, they have not gone through a winter yet. So they'll have more green stem than just leafy growth. There are some, um, some differences though. There's two different types of fruits. So this is where it gets a little confusing. We have summer bearing, which are bearing fruit that second year on those floricanes. That's kind of the normal kind of raspberry that you're used to growing, um, that we've been growing for a long time. So first year the canes grow up, they go through the winter, the next year they turn into flowers and fruit. So your summer reds, your summer black, and your summer purple are all summer bearing raspberries. Then we have what's called fall bearing. And these are a little different. Um, they're going to be bearing their fruits and their flowers on those primocanes, those first year canes. So they're really kind of a, um, it's like the express version of raspberries. Everything's gonna happen really quickly in one year. And those are gonna be called ever bearing red and ever bearing yellow. I wish they would have picked a different name because they're not really ever bearing, they're fall bearing. <laughs> and so this is where a lot of people just get confused with those and strawberries. You're not getting multiple fruits like you do with the strawberries, different, you know, uh, multiple harvests. You get that fall harvest, but it's happening on first year canes. So I'm sure we'll get a question about that at the end here. So, so thinking about the normal raspberries, the ones that grow up one year, go through the winter, and then they turn into flowers and fruits. This is what we're gonna start talking about. In late winter, early spring, you wanna go in and remove last year's floor canes that have fruited. Once they put those flowers and fruits on, they're done. And so um, you can kind of see in that picture there, the one that they're cutting, notice the color difference compared to the other floor canes that you can see there. Um, this one is 
now going into its third year, so it's dead. And that's what you want to remove. Look for that kind of grayish white um, bark color. Um, you can also tell that they're really, really dry, whereas the other ones are a little more bendable. So remove the ones that, that bared their fruit last year and go ahead and cut those off all the way to the ground. And you want to get those canes out of your, your patch. They can um, have insects that lay eggs and hatch in the stems. Um, they could have disease on them. It's just not good practice to keep those around. Then you want to go in and remove some of the smaller canes um, just to kind of thin them out a little bit. You don't want your patch to be really, really thick. Remember, at this point in time, you're not going to be seeing those new primocanes yet because they haven't started growing up out of the ground. So we're only dealing with last year's canes. All right, so um, if you do have winter killed tip on the canes that you leave back, you can just tip those off and they'll be, they'll be all right. So here you can see in this picture kind of how they've gone through and really thinned this back. Um, they don't show the flora canes from last year in here. Again, those are dead. You cut those out. But then you're left with all of these second year canes. And this is what you want to um, thin out. Sometimes those second year canes will have what we call laterals on them, which means they'll have already branched. And those branches can get kind of long and arching. And if those branches actually touch the ground, they can tip root into the soil. Um, you can take those tip rooted plants and cut them maybe about five or six inches up the stem that's rooted into the ground and then dig that out and you've got a new plant. So there's a little tip for you. But with other ones with these laterals that are really long, um, we want to go ahead and cut those back just to keep our patch a little more um, tidy and easier to work with. So you can see that these laterals, again, which is just those branches off the main stem there, they've been cut back to about six to eight inches. And you'll still get plenty of raspberries. By reducing the number of fruits, you're going to get bigger fruits and better fruits. So here are some good summer bearing, good old raspberries that we've been growing for a long time. Uh, Nova, Killarney, Boyne is a pretty, uh, pretty popular one, Latham, Newburgh, and Titan. So then we have these strange fall bearing type raspberries, right? So again, I said, these are like the express version. Everything's gonna happen really quickly. Your berries are gonna get produced on those new canes that grew that year at the end of the season. Um, and they're gonna actually, instead of putting out these laterals like the ones we just looked at, they're gonna be putting their fruit all up and down that main stem. They tend to sucker a lot. Um, you'll get a lot of canes, they'll be, um, a little more thick um, and, and harder to work with sometimes. Um, but they're easy in that at the end of the season, you literally just prune all the canes to the ground and start over. Um, it's said that you can even use a lawnmower for this, although I think my lawnmower blade might be worth more than my raspberry patch. So I think I will just prune them down with my pruners. But you can see that if you're gonna grow these in containers or in a smaller space, um, like a patio, that maybe these fall bearing types are what you want because you're not growing those plants in a big giant system. So, um, you know, that's pretty much it with the fall bearing. Again, they're really simple. You just grow them up, let them do their thing and then cut them back every once they're done fruiting. Um, there are a lot of different varieties out there. Um, of the fall bearing types that work well in Colorado. A um, couple to note here, Anne is a yellow fruited one, which is just kind of interesting to have. Um, Jacqueline's a very popular one. Um, Heritage is another really popular one. That those are just normal red types. And then there's Joan Jay, which is uh, nearly thornless, which so if you have kids um, that you're wanting to grow these with, it might be a nice one to try out. As far as all these raspberry grow, raspberries go, um, just know that this patch might last up to 15 years. So you really want to make sure you have good growing conditions for it. Just like your strawberries, they want to be planted in full sun with at least eight hours of sunlight per day. And then also like the strawberries, avoid that windy spot or give them some kind of wind protection. Um, in my yard, I've got them kind of tucked in between 
my north fence and my east fence. So when that wind comes from the north, it's going, the fence is acting as a nice barrier um, for my strawberries. Uh, don't plant your raspberries after strawberries or other raspberries, or again, those tomatoes, peppers, um, vining crops like cucumbers. Again, in the same family as strawberries, and they're all in that rose family, and so they can all get that same um, soil-borne disease if you have it. Um, so it's just good practice to do good crop rotation. As far as irrigation goes, with your straw or with your raspberries, excuse me, you want to do light but frequent watering. They're going to need up to three inches of water per week when they're setting their fruits. Um, you know when you bite into a raspberry, there's so much juice in there, and that's because of that good watering. Um, drip irrigation is great. It's going to reduce diseases that you have on the plants. Always better to water at the base of the plant if you can. Um, if you're hand watering, just water down at the bottom. You don't have to, um, you don't have to spray the whole plant off. You are going to need some kind of a trellis system. Um, you know, these raspberries, and then we'll talk about blackberries shortly, they have kind of a weeping habit to them. So to have that wire on either side to really help hold those canes up is really, really helpful. Um, and they're, so they're just going to grow within this little box that you've created. This is a double wire tea trellis. Um, your raspberries probably aren't going to make it to that second level. But if you ever wanted to plant blackberries and something like this, they get a lot taller. And so this is where you could use the same trellis maybe for two different types of crops. Um, but that lower wire about at knee height is the one that's going to form that nice box around your raspberry plants. Here's another picture of a tea trellis. Um, not a hard system to put together. It's just a two wire system. Um, again, always thin out that that patch or that row to about 10 canes per four feet is what you're looking at. And this is for those, um, you know, those summer bearing types that go through the two years. Raspberries come in lots of different colors. I just wanted to kind of show this to you just to show all the different variety um, that's out there. The gold ones, the fall gold, the Anne or the honey queens. Um, there's black ones. I've grown both of these, Jewel and Mac Black. Um, and then purple, there's one called Royalty, but it the purple ones really don't do that great here in Colorado. And so um, we're going to move into blackberries in the next section. I'll stop in a minute to take some questions. But um, before we do, just to know the difference between the blackberries and the raspberries, it's very simple that the black, blackberries hold on to their receptacle when they're picked, whereas the raspberries leave the receptacle on the plant and you're just pulling off the fruit, and so they're hollow inside. And really, other than that, they're in the same family, they're in the same genus. Um, they taste different though, <laughs> that's for sure. So let's see, do we have any questions on, I don't see anything in the chat box. I think I'll just keep on going if that's all right. If you guys have questions, feel free to put them in that chat box. All right, so let's talk a little more about blackberries. Um, oh, I forgot, I have one more slide here. Before we get into the blackberries, we do have some that kind of, remember I said these are in the same family, the same genus. We do have some that are kind of right in the middle uh, between the blackberries and the raspberries. And these are some hybrids. Um, and so boysenberries, loganberries, and tayberries are kind of that in between. And they tend to be considered more of a blackberry type because they hold on to that, that receptacle inside the fruit. Um, these aren't really that common here in Colorado, though, because they do have hardiness issues. And um, you know their watering needs might be a little different than what we can provide for them here. But just know that if you eat a boysenberry, that it's halfway between a, a blackberry and a raspberry. All right, now into the blackberries. So these are Rubus fruticosis. And just like the raspberries and just like the strawberries, there's different kinds of raspberries as well. So we have three main types, and these are all classified according to how they grow. We've got our erect blackberries that have a very stiff um, but arching cane, 
Um, they can be somewhat self-supporting. They're gonna be pretty upright in their growth, but they're not as hardy here. Um, they can sometimes get killed off by the spring temperatures. Uh, and then these are the thorny kinds. So um, there are a few thornless erect types, but really the next type, the semi-erect, um, those are gonna be a little bit more typical of what we see growing here. And these are gonna be thornless for the most part. And trellising on these is gonna be necessary. Sorry about my typo there. Um, and then there's that third type, and this is called the trailing um, blackberry. And these really don't do well in Colorado. They really have a, a lower threshold of about 13 degrees, which we know it gets well below that a lot. Um, so I don't recommend the trailing blackberries here. So the two main erect types that we grow in Colorado, and, and really this is kind of across the whole United States, are Prime Jan and Prime Jim. These have been around for quite some time. Um, they are thorny, um, but easy to grow and pretty reliable. And then as far as those semi-erect types go, and again, these are also grown across the country, is Triple Crown and Chester. And I've grown both of these types as well. Um, the Triple Crown is definitely thornless, a uh, nice one to grow, big giant berries. Um, some of these berries, almost the size, I've seen these things almost the size of a ping pong ball, which is just crazy. So when you're planting blackberries, they're very similar to that um, summer bearing raspberry, but just on a bigger scale. So you know, again, the semi-erect cultivars, the Triple Crown and the Chester do the best here. Um, and so for those, you're gonna wanna give them plenty of room. You're spacing those about five or six feet apart. Um, whereas your raspberries and then some of these um, more upright blackberries, you can go a lot closer with those. As far as cultural needs goes, again, they're very similar to raspberries in terms of fertilizer, irrigation and planting, just on a bigger scale. They get a lot taller. So here's another trellising system. Um, again, a T trellis. This one has two wires. Well, it has four wires, um, two sets of wires. And this two wire system is set up so that you have one wire pretty low, about 18 inches um, above, and I'm sorry, one wire at about knee level, and then the next wire about 18 inches above that. We have a garden note number 762 that can walk you through the pruning information based on what type of variety you're growing. Just a little taste of the pruning though. Remember I said these are very similar to those summer bearing raspberries where it's those second year canes that are gonna put on the fruits and the flowers and they're gonna have those laterals on them. And so with these, you're gonna wanna um, thin out the canes just like you did before, uh, remove the dead ones from the year before that have already flowered and fruited and then you're gonna to start to cut back these lateral branches. Um, but here you're gonna do that um, a little bit bigger, oh, sorry about that, to about 12 to 18 inches on the laterals for the uh, blackberries. Again, just a bigger, a bigger scale. So next is blueberries. I do see a chat question, let me pop this up. Okay, so Cassandra asks, if my raspberries haven't fruited in the last three years, should I give them some fertilizer? Yes, I would definitely give them some fertilizer. Um, you might try a nice balanced fertilizer and by balance, we just mean that all three numbers are the same. So it could be like a 10, 10, 10 or a 14, 14, 14 or kind of common ones. Um, that might help. Um, you also, if you haven't, Cassandra, if you haven't cut them down ever, um, that can sometimes stimulate some new growth. So even if you, if you aren't sure what kind of raspberries you have, just cut them all down to the ground <laughs> and then see what, see if you get any fruit the next year. And if you don't, then you have the summer bearing kind that take two years to fruit. But if you do get fruit the next year after you've cut them all down, then you've got the fall bearing type that are the express type. So yeah, a little fertilizer, um, thinning out that patch can help have less um, flowers for that energy to go to. So you'll, you'll get better fruit, bigger fruit, um, maybe a little more reliable. So hopefully that answered your question there. All right, great, thank you. All right, so let's move on to blueberries. 
So blueberries are interesting. They're, they're out here anyway. They're considered the holy grail of small fruits. Um, we've all heard of the numerous health benefits to eating blueberries. They're high in antioxidants. They're high in vitamins, um, good for you. And we really want to grow these in Colorado. But let me tell you, it's, it's, if you can figure out how to grow blueberries on a large scale in Colorado reliably for many years, you will be a rich person. Um, we have a lot of things working against us. So we've got high soil pH, we've got um, thick soils, clayey soils, um, or maybe they're, they're too sandy. Um, it's really the soil that is the biggest problem uh, with our blueberries. And then we have things like it's arid, it, the air dries really quickly. Um, blueberries don't like to have their uh, leaves drying out like that. Um, and then we have the cold. So we have some ups and downs in our temperatures as well. Um, I don't have it on here, but there are three main types of blueberries. There's what we call low bush blueberries. And those are the little tiny um, blueberries that you'll often see them in blueberry muffins or things like that. Um, those come from Maine. And Maine is very different than here. We do not have the same climate at all. And so they're growing the low bush types. Then there's the high bush blueberries. These get pretty large. They can get to be up to six feet tall um, and wide. This is what we grew in Kentucky and it's grown a across a lot of the Midwest. Um, if you were to buy a, a blueberry bush to try, I would buy a, a high bush blueberry type. And then there's another kind called rabbit eye and they're just, um, they're more for up in maybe like Michigan area where they're um, very temperate and they have those um, mild winters with lots of snow, but, but their temperatures don't swing like they do here. So high bush blueberries, if you're gonna try this. So here is the, the dirty truth about the blueberries. They're very difficult <laughs> and they're not a, I'm gonna plant this and let's just see what happens. You probably won't get much of anything. Um, if you want blueberries to grow, you have to make a commitment to them and you have to try to adapt them to your growing conditions and you have a lot of amending to do to do that. You will never grow blueberries in Colorado's native soil ever. Now, I'm sure that there's people that wanna argue about this. Oh, I have a blueberry bush in my backyard in Greeley and it's been there for 20 years. And my question to you would be, have you ever gotten fruit off of it? <laughs> and if so, has it been more than a handful? <laughs> so um, they just don't like our soil. So you see in that picture there, this was actually taken in Virginia even in Virginia, where they have ideal soil for these, they're having to heavily amend it with what's called peat moss. So if you do want to do this in Colorado, this is the system that you're going to look at. Um, you're going to be growing them literally in a bale of peat moss. And that's what we call this um, kind of square. It's like a hay bale, but it's, it's peat moss any, instead of hay. That's why they call it a bale. Um, but that's about, I want to say it's like three and a half cubic feet of compressed peat moss in that bag. And so um, you have to keep the root zone very moist all year long, even in the winter. Um, to get that to make it through winter, you're going to have to bury that peat moss bale in the ground, or you're going to have to haul it into a shed or into a garage over the winter months, but still watering it to keep it moist. Um, you have to protect it from the drying winds. You have to wrap it in burlap or sheets during its dormant period to help it make it through those winters. And then to make matters worse, you can't just do this with one plant. You need two plants with two different varieties to cross pollinate. So hopefully I have discouraged you a little bit <laughs> from growing blueberries and you can just buy those at your local grocery store. <laughs> because is this really practical? I mean, not really. Um, it's a fun thing to do that. If you're an avid gardener and you want a challenge and this is going to be your thing, totally go for it. Um, I just don't want people to get disappointed. Um, it's not for the beginning gardener. So yeah, so buy your, you know, buy your blueberries in bulk. Um, the plants don't produce very big volumes of fruit. So we grew at, in Kentucky. I had um, about seven well, let me back up. We had about 200 full-size blueberry plants. 
we would harvest about once a week and we'd get several pints, but you're talking 200 plants. So um, you might get a pint off a plant about that much. So they're not water wise. Um, so if you're trying to save water, they're not gonna be, you're not gonna be the plant for you. Um, and it's just like, you know, basically you're growing them in a container. So there's a system where they're growing big giant containers of blueberries. And over time, you're gonna have to replace these bushes because their root systems are gonna outgrow those containers um, fairly often. So again, hopefully I've kind of discouraged you a little bit from blueberries. I will answer a few questions. Do we have any on blueberries? I'll take a quick drink here. All right, so, so I know blueberries may not grow well here. There are some other great small fruits um, that are similar to blueberries that need less water and maintenance and can be just as satisfying. So in the next slides, we're gonna talk about currants and gooseberries and grapes, but I also wanna mention service berries. Um, this is a, a picture of a Saskatoon service berry. And this is an ornamental plant that you might put out in your landscape and you can get you know, really nice fruits off of these. The birds also love them too, but um, just know that service berries are edible. So we're not gonna talk too much about those. I do wanna cover the, the currants and the gooseberries and the josta berries. So these are all in the same family. These are called the ribes uh, species. Um, these are woody perennial shrubs that are about three feet tall to six feet tall and then the same width. Um, these are things that you can incorporate into your landscape if you want to have that edible landscape look. Um, and, and really, they're quite ornamental, too. Um, most of these are what we call self-fruitful, which means you don't have to have two different varieties. You don't have to have two different plants. Um, even on the same plant, sometimes even the same flower can pollinate itself. And these are really easily grown at higher elevations. You see these if you're ever you know, walking through the mountains, taking a nice hike, look all around you, you can probably find some currants or some gooseberries around. Um, and also why they do well in Colorado. So let's start out with the currants. So black currants, these are great for jellies and pastries, and they're really high in vitamin C, so very good for you. Um, these are um, a little bit more sweet than the other types of currants. And so here are a few varieties that work well in Colorado. The picture there is the Allegan. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But there are several varieties of the black currants available. Then we have red currants. Um, these are a little bit more tart. And because of that, they're really more for jellies. You need to have that added sugar to make them palatable. Um, I personally love red currant jelly. I like that tart flavor. And it makes a really nice barbecue sauce if you mix it with mustard and maybe um, a little salt and pepper. And you can add a little extra barbecue sauce in there. Fantastic. So red currants also grow very very well in Colorado. Uh, the one in the picture here is called Red Lake. You can see it has a, a big cluster of fruits coming off of it. Um, but there's plenty of other ones out there as well. And then we have the white currants, which are actually just red currants that have been selected out for a pale color. Um, sometimes people will confuse the white currants with the gooseberries that I'm going to show you next. But notice how the white currants are in a, a nice cluster here. They're, they're grown, the berries form along these, um, these long chains of fruits. These are the sweetest of the currants. Um, you can pick these right off of the bush and eat them fresh, uh, really good. And there's, again, a few different varieties out there. So again, Gooseberries, although sometimes confused with the white or the pink currants, are a totally, di well, they're not totally different, but they're kind of slightly different type of fruit. They're also self-fruitful, but these are born singly, so you don't see those big, long chains of tiny berries. Instead, you get these larger berries, about a half inch in, in diameter, um, that are here and there on the plant. There's European types, and then there's American types. Um, here, the European types um, tend to be more susceptible to a disease we call powdery mildew, and that's just where the leaves, the surface of the leaf looks like it has a white um, fuzz or a white powder on it, and it can 
it can um, inhibit photosynthesis of the plant and kind of weaken the plant. It doesn't hurt the fruit necessarily. You can still eat it and the fruit's not affected. But over time, that plant can go, can be stressed. Um, the American types though, many of which are native to Colorado, are, are tend to be a little bit more on the tart side. Um, but as I mentioned, these are up in the mountains all over the place. And so you know that they can grow well here. They can tolerate our climate and they can tolerate our poor soils. So here are some gooseberry cultivars for you. Um, lots of good acceptable varieties. The one in the picture there is called Pixwell. Um, there's one called Welcome that I think has less thorns. So do know that some of these have thorns to them. And there's a couple to avoid downing and colossal, just mentioned in the literature that they just don't grow well here. And then we have Josta berries. And so this might be a new thing for a lot of you. I, I wasn't very familiar with Josta berries until I started doing some research for this class. But these are actually a hybrid of the gooseberry and the black currant. They're almost completely black and they have nice large berries. Um, there are some red types available. But with these, unlike the Josta berries and the currants that are self fruitful, they do better if you have a couple different types. So maybe both black and red, and maybe a couple different bushes. Um, you want to wait until those berries are fully ripened. Um, you can see they get kind of a nice shine to them and that nice dark color, and they're going to have a soft texture, and that's how you know they're ready. So for all of these, the currants, the gooseberries, and the josta berries, you want to plant these in early spring. Um, they're going to be bigger than some of your other fruits like your raspberries, so give them some space. They're going to need about three and a half to four and a half feet um, per bush apart. Um, you want to make sure they've got a nice, well-drained, loose soil. You don't want to put them in really heavy clay, but they're, they're going to be more adaptable to our soils than some other stuff. So um, your soil type might be okay here. Um, but what we do want to watch out for, especially down here along the front range, if you've got a hot spot in your yard, um, that's probably not the best pl place to plant these. You want to put them maybe in a little bit of part shade, uh, maybe to the north side of your house. They like the sunlight, but it's too hot down here for them. Whereas up in the mountains, they're getting full sun, but they just don't have the heat that we do. So you just kind of have to give them a little part shade to baby them a little bit down here along the front range, or they can get things like mites um, or other issues and just they look a little dried out. Very hardy here in Colorado, all the way to zone three. You can grow these all the way up at probably 10,000 feet in elevation. Um, every year you want to head back the branches to about five, or I'm sorry, not every year. When you plant them, you want to head the branches back to about five inches. And I'm going to show you a picture, um, I think in the next slide, about how to prune these every year. Again, don't forget, you can mix these in with your normal landscape because they are ornamental as well. Um, notice the bottom picture there. You can just kind of barely see that has what's called a bird netting over that um, that planting and that's going to help keep the fruit for you and not the birds but if you don't mind the birds eating your fruits go ahead and let them have them all right so pruning your currants or your gooseberries um, you want to wait until late winter early spring again that's the same time we're pruning our blackberries and our raspberries um, and and i like to say it like this you know, you're kind of doing surgery on a plant when you go and you prune off and you're cutting off its branches here and there. And nobody wants to have surgery while they're awake. So this is why we wait until late winter, um, very early spring, before those buds open up, because those plants have been sleeping for a really long time. They're nice and dormant, and we're not going to stress them out by cutting on them in the middle of the growing season. So wait till late winter, early spring. And that goes for most of your woody plants. There's a few that you want to prune in the summer, um, but those are things like lilacs that are blooming on old wood. Um, so in the picture here, you can see I've circled some numbers here. When you're pruning out this bush, you want to have, if you can tell, you want to have three one-year-old canes that are just single stems, no branching, two of, or three of the two-year-old canes that might have a branch or two here and there, and then a few of the three-year-old canes, the older canes. So you're just going out, the reason, and you know, it's not an exact science, but 
you just want to make sure you're not removing all of the three-year-old wood because or the two-year-old wood because that's where they're going to have their fruit um, so give it a good mix of new growth and older growth any questions on the currants and the gooseberries and josta berries i don't see anything and i'll take some more questions at the end if you have some all right let's move on to grapes and this is the last fruit we're going to talk about today. Um, so for your grapes, we've got two main types of grapes. We've got table grapes, which are the sweet, fresh eating grapes. And then we have wine grapes that are great for making wine. Um, all in the same family, same genus. They're all in the vitis um, genus. When you're choosing a site for your grapes, um, this is one that's going to be a little different. I told you that most of our fruits like those nice, well-drained, um, good soils. Other than the currants, um, those and these can really take a more lean soil. Um, they're going to be kind of shallow rooted, and so, um, and they're not going to want a soil that's been heavily, heavily amended. So if you've got kind of a more of a poor soil, a grape might do okay there. Um, look for a nice rolling terrain we don't want frost pockets around our grapes we don't want air settling into valleys we want that air to kind of roll off so if you've got um, a little hill that would be a great place to put uh, some grapes they do like drier conditions and so a little more water wise for you and when you're planting these you want to always do a soil test find out again you want to make sure it's not too um, too lush of a soil, but also you want to make sure it has adequate nutrients. And then follow the spacing that's recommended for the variety you choose. There's a ton of different varieties of grapes, and it's it's hard to say exactly what that spacing should be because they're all a little bit different. So when you're planting grapes, um, you buy these in the spring as what are called bare root plants, and that's what you can see here in the picture. They don't look like much. Um, but there's probably about 25 or 30 plants in that little bundle. You want to soak those for about three hours. That's just really going to help you establish those better. Um, it's going to keep the roots from drying out. And then when they do go in the ground, they're going to be ready to start pulling up the water um, that's around them. So go ahead and soak those roots. You want to look for that um, planting depth at which they grew in the nursery. So look for where the roots stop. Um, up on that stem and that's going to be where you want to plant these. Space them and again I said spacing depends on the variety so anywhere between six to eight feet apart. I've seen these though as far as 15 or 20 feet apart. It just depends on the variety and how you're going to grow them. You're going to have to have a trellis system set up within the first year. Um, they're going to start growing long canes and we're going to have to start training those canes very early on. And after you plant them, um, you want to cut them back if you can to the about two or three strong buds and if there's any side canes growing at planting go ahead and cut those off so here you can see some different types of trellises that have been built for grapes um, probably the most common that we've seen on a home scale is the arbor which works fantastic just got to give it something to climb on so here they've used like some um, livestock fencing and, so, and just built that arbor and it's just gonna climb up and over and that's just perfectly fine. Um, you can also go with a system where you've got a few different wires and where you're gonna be training those, um, those plants to grow along those wires with, different, with arms. And I'll show you some pictures here in a second. Um, make sure that those wires can be tightened though. You definitely wanna have a nice, strong, tight trellis system for all of these. So here is a picture of a grape plant. Um, you can see the main trunk there. Um, at the base of that trunk, you see that swollen area. That's what's called a graft union. And that's just where the root system of one plant has been met up with the top of another plant. Um, that can give the plant more cold hardiness. It might help with diseases. Um, but that root system is more acclimated you know, to growing here in the United States. But then that top growth might be that French grape that you've always wanted. Um, so that's what's called grafting. So be on the lookout for that graft union. Anything that's coming out below that graft union on the ground are called suckers, and those aren't going to have the fruit that you want. 
Um, so you don't want to keep those around and you don't want to train those up to be new arms. As you move up um, along that trunk, you do see that water sprout coming out. That could be a good insurance type situation where if your main arm or cordon, like the two at the top there, if one of those happens to die off, you can take that water sprout and train it into a new arm. Um, because it is above the graft union, you know you're going to get the same fruit back that you want. So and then along the top, you see those cordons. Um, those are those canes that have been trained to grow along that wire. They're called the arms as well. And then off of those is where you're going to get your little spurs, which grow new canes and put your fruit set on. So there are a lot of different types of systems that you can grow um, grapes in, in, in Colorado. Um, we prefer uh, the Niffin system, which is a four cane system. So you can see that at the bottom, um, there's a main trunk and then there's a set of arms on the lower wire and then a set of arms on the upper wire. Here's just another picture of a trellising or a training system. Um, this one, they've only got two arms. So this is actually what we call a single curtain, which just means it has one, um, one layer. Whereas this system, the Niffin system, is, what is also known as a double curtain, so two layers. Lots of terminology in the fruit world. So let's talk a little bit about the buds. Um, remember I said those cordons are the arms, and then off of those arms, you're going to get these little spurs. And those spurs are shoots from last year that hold buds that are going to form the new canes for this year. And it's, a, it's an inverse relationship, just like all of these, between bud count and fruit production. The less buds you have, the less flowers, um, the less fruits, the better fruit production you're actually going to have. You're going to have better fruits, bigger fruits, more healthy fruits. So we really need to be pruning our grapes to leave only two buds per spur, um, maybe three, maybe four, if you're worried about, um, you know, if one or two is not going to make it. Um, but we definitely need to be pruning these back. We often get calls in the office about um, grapevine plants that are, you know, 10, 20 years old that they've never pruned and they're just not producing. Um, and then if you cut those back, then they see, okay, now they start producing again. And that's that relationship between the number of buds and how much fruit you're going to get. So you have to continually prune them every year. Um, avoid cutting too close to those buds. You want to actually, this is the one time I'll tell you to cut it right in the middle of the stem. Normally we go right above the bud, but grapes dry down a lot. And so we want to give that stem plenty of room to, to die back before it hits that bud. We don't want that top bud to die. So cut it right in between those two buds. And then as I mentioned, over time, these things can get to be looking pretty gnarly. Um, we're continually cutting and cutting and cutting. So that growth gets compacted um, along that arm and they just start to look kind of um, Halloween-ish, <laughs> if you will. But you have to keep cutting them back like that to keep regenerating that plant. So I mentioned there's different types. There's table grapes and then there's wine grapes. The table grapes are, are fresh eating grapes. Um, you can get either seeded varieties or seedless varieties. Um, I, I don't mind the seeded varieties. I just, you know, eat them and then spit the seed out. No big deal. Um, some of these have really great flavor. If you've ever eaten a fresh Concord grape right off the vine, it tastes like you're literally eating a spoonful of Welch's jelly. So good. Um, Niagara is similar to Concord, you know, that, that normal jelly grape we all think of, but it's a white grape. Um, so they're using that one for a lot of the white grape juices that we buy in the grocery store. One that grows really well here is St. Teresa. Um, it's just really nice and cold hardy, pretty reliable in Colorado. And it's actually a plant select plant, which means it's gone through the CSU research program with Denver Botanic Gardens, and it came out with great results. So lots of different types of table grapes. Maybe you want to try your, your hand in some wine grapes and some wine making. Um, these are going to be smaller grapes. They're going to be more concentrated in flavor. So they're going to be more tart, maybe even a little more sour. The, the skin on these is a lot thicker um, and they all have seeds in them. Um, the color on the inside of the grape, even these dark red grapes is actually clear 
or white. And so all that color that you have in your wines comes from the skin, um, which is just kind of interesting. Um, there's very few wine grapes that are going to do that great with our roller coaster temperatures that we have, um, especially those that are that are French grapes. So, um, the, you know, the the typical grapes that you think of going into wine, Chardonnay, Merlot, Cabernet, um, these aren't going to do, really do that great. Not only in Colorado, but really in the United States, they just don't do that well. And so what we do are these French American hybrids. And um, they're American grapes that we've crossed with French grapes, and they do much better in our temperatures. And they produce more of a sweeter wine. So if you like a dry wine, um, you're probably not going to find that with these hybrids. So here's some good cultivars for wine if you're going to if you're looking for the red types. And you may have not really heard of many of these. Um, most most of us have heard of Cab Franc, but Chamberson, which is in the picture here, is one that we just don't hear of. Um, and so when you're buying local wine, a lot of times it'll just say sweet red, Colorado sweet red, red wine. And, but that might be a Chancellor or a Chamberson. We just haven't trained ourselves to get to know these varieties like we do the Chardonnays and the Merlots. Um, you could go Pinot Noir if you're lucky. It's very marginal here. Um, so yeah, different reds. And then there's also good different white wines for here. Again, you don't see Riesling, you don't see um, Chardonnay. Those are French types. These are those American French hybrids. Um, so even back in Kentucky, we grew the Gewürztraminer and the Vignole. And the Vignole makes a really nice sweet white wine. Um, and that's what you see in the picture here. So overall, um, you know, you can grow grapes in Colorado. I was just down in the Boulder area about a week ago and I saw somebody that probably had maybe 50 vines growing right there in their front yard. They made a little vineyard out of their front yard. I don't know if they were growing the table grapes or the wine grapes, but they looked like they were doing pretty well. Um, a couple things, um, some problems that you can have with grapes, um, poor drainage. They, they don't like to be sitting in water. Um, they really prefer to be kind of up on a slope if you can, where they're going to dry, that soil is going to dry out periodically. Um, you know, the quality of your vines at purchase may not be the best with grapes. Um, they're hard to even grow in nurseries sometimes. So um, maybe order a little extra and hedge your bets. Um, don't plant these too late in the season. You want to make sure that these go in the ground early on because they want to um, have some time to get acc acclimated. Um, and then, you know, irrigation wise, again, make sure that you're not overwatering these, but they do like to be wet, um, or not wet, but they do like, um, what was the word, consistent moisture, but not wet. And then, um, it's hard to control weeds and diseases around grapes, um, just because sometimes it's it, hard to work around those, those shallow root systems. So there's some issues, but it's it's doable all right so that concludes our class i do want to bring your attention to all of the csu resources that are available for small fruits um so if you just go and do a normal internet search and just type in colorado master gardener small fruits it will take you to this page and you see on here we've got um, great information out there on all of the fruits we talked about today, even a couple we didn't talk about. And um, you can really find a ton of great resources on all different gardening topics on that same website. And so I think that concludes everything. So let me pop this back up. I'll take any last questions if you have them. And I will also pop my camera back on. Great. And so if you want to, I think you might be able to unmute yourself, maybe. I don't know. Sandra, you, maybe we have that set to the, where they can't. But um, if you have any other questions, we can pop them in the chat. Here we go. When do Josta berries fruit? That's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, I will see if I can look that up real quick while we're um, while we're talking. 
but yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I've never had, I've never grown Josta berries. I wasn't even that familiar with them before, um, before starting this, this class. Um, I will say that University of Idaho Extension has a really nice bulletin out on growing currants, gooseberries, and Josta berries. And I'm going to see if I can find out here real quick um, when they fruit. Any other questions? Hi, Amy. I think um, Miranda had a question in the oh, chat. Did I miss one? Oh, I did. I missed one. I have blackberries, and some of the leaves are turning black with some rust color. Um, I guess my question would be, when did you start noticing this? Was this something that just happened this year and recently? And so, um, yes, it was a few weeks ago. Okay. So, mid-April, we had a little bit of a freeze. It could be, and then we had those, I don't know, Miranda, I'm guessing you're in the green really area but we've had a couple pretty crazy storms lately where we had the winds coming out of the first they came out of the south and then the next day or two days later they started coming out of the north and a lot of our plants were just really getting hit hard with that wind and so i'm actually going to guess that some of that black might be um the leaves where they have um, died off and are just starting to um to go down at the end of the season um they do turn rust color so it could be that same that same thing like maybe there was just some storm damage and now they're you know you're going to lose some of the the growth um are you noticing this on the whole plant or just on the outer leaves maybe um and then does it look like there's some green growth coming back would be my next question to kind of drill down and see what um, might be causing that um, I'm still looking up Josta berries as well to find out when they fruit. I'm just not finding it. <laughs> I'm just not finding it. All right, so yes, it was, um, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Are there any fruits or vegetables we can still plant this summer? What fruits or vegetables are perennials? And is there anything edible that we can grow indoors? Okay. So let's start with the first one. Um, yes, there are some fruits and vegetables you can still plant. Um, it's not too late. You can probably get a zucchini. Um, they grow, once they get going, they grow pretty fast and, and they fruit pretty profusely. So you could try that. Um, it's not too late. It's getting close to, but not too late to plant some of our winter squashes. So um, butternut squash, acorn squash, uh, maybe a spaghetti squash. Um, pumpkins, um, we're, we're getting close. Those are about, um, some of those are about 80 to 100 days till they start to put fruits on and then you gotta give them a little time. Um, but maybe you could try that. Um, what fruits and vegetables are perennials? Um, so for the fruits, most of our fruits are perennials. Um, gosh, I don't, I don't, off the top of my head, I can't think of, the only thing I can think of that might be an annual I can't think of anything off the top of my head that might be an annual as far as the fruits are concerned. Um, vegetables, most of our vegetables are annuals. So it's kind of opposite. Fruits are perennials. Most vegetables are annuals. Um, vegetables come to us from all over the world, mostly along the equator. And so um, they don't make it through our winters. So all of those things you're growing in your garden, like your lettuces and your tomatoes, peppers, squashes, cucumbers, those are all annuals. You have to replant them every year. Um, there's a few that come back year after year, one being asparagus is a perennial. Um, and then there's, I'm sure there's a, a garlic would be one that's kind of a perennial or a biennial. Um, but yeah, most of those are annuals. And is there anything edible that we can grow indoors? You can grow a lot of stuff indoors um, that's edible. Um, the problem with growing indoors is you have to be prepared for the critters that come along with growing stuff indoors. So you might get some fungus gnats, you might get some fruit flies, you might get some white flies in your home. Um, and those come along mostly with um, fungus gnats happen because the soils consistently 
perfectly moist. And so they're, they're just going to use that as a little breeding ground. Um, but you can grow plenty of stuff inside. You can grow some herbs inside, like basil would do really nice um, inside. Um, let's see. I mean, really, you just need to have the space. Lettuces, you can grow indoors. Um, you can get one of those tower gardens and try that. So, um, but mostly the prob one of the bigger problems with growing indoors is you just don't get enough light. Even in a south facing window, it's often not, um, not enough light for a long enough period of time to really give you good growth. Um, but it can be done. Um, like I said, some of the lettuces can, can do well indoors and, and then herbs. Um, so on the, looks like on the um, blackberry question there on the outside with more growth. Yeah, I'm gonna stick with my answer to you, Miranda, that I'm, I'm pretty sure that that was just where those outer leaves got hit with the wind so hard that it dried them out and they started to turn black and maybe red and, and are gonna probably just fall off. You can go in and, and just prune back a little bit, cut that, that damaged growth out of there and, and I think it'll be okay. All right. Well, I think that's got it. Thanks for joining everyone. Yeah, thank you again, Amy. This was very informative. Um, and again, I'll go ahead. If any of you are interested in a copy, a PDF copy of the PowerPoint, um, I'll go ahead and put my email address in the chat and then um, I'll send that out to you. So Great. thank you so much again, Amy. This was wonderful. You're welcome. All right. Well, thanks for joining. We'll do this again. Thanks. All right. Have a good day, everyone.